why, why does Web3 matter? Last year, we had $24 billion of sales in NFTs. 90% of that value went to creators and owners of these NFTs. In that same year, Spotify paid out $7 billion to creators. What we're seeing already, and this is, you know, Spotify serves millions of creators and hundreds of millions of users in contrast to the Web3 NFT space, which is still, you know, much smaller in number. Imagine what happens when you onboard the Spotify community fully into Web3, what happens to their value and how that's distributed. And that's why Web3 matters. And if you want to understand Web3 and the open metaverse, there really is no going back. And that's why I think it's a foregone conclusion from our perspective that Web3 will ultimately, you know, the web of ownership will ultimately be the sort of future iteration of the web as we transition from Web2 to Web3. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Web3 Deep Dive. I'm your host, Rachel Wolfson. This show focuses on real-world Web3 use cases to help you better understand how this technology is being applied today and how it may be applied in the future. If this sounds interesting, please be sure to subscribe to the show so you stay up to date with all the new episodes. Before getting started with today's episode, I'd like to thank Worsta for making Web3 Deep Dive possible. Worsta is a global technology consultancy with headquarters in Austin, Texas and Quito, Ecuador. Worsta works with enterprises to help them make sound business decisions on all of their core technologies. And before we get started with the show, I also just want to remind you guys that Web3 Deep Dive is for educational and entertainment purposes only and does not offer any forms of financial advice at all. Without further ado, let's dig deep into Web3. Today's episode is with Yat Su. He's the chairman of Animoca Brands. Let's get to it. Hi, Yad. How are you? I'm great. It's uh, great to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you. And I'm so excited that you're here in Austin uh, at the Web3 Deep Dive studio. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great setup you have here. And I haven't been to Austin in, I think, maybe seven or eight years. So, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's not exactly in the typical path of where I travel. So it's wonderful to be here and, and check it out. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're here. You need to come more often. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Web3 today and get your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Before we get started, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, what you're doing? You're the chairman of Animoca Brands. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Yatsu. I'm chairman and co-founder of Animoca Brands. Animoca is a company that has been focused on, I guess, what we call digital property rights, which is represented by us through NFTs, non-fungible tokens, really since 2017, since the birth of CryptoKitties. A lot of people know us as investors, even though we're not technically a fund, we invested out of a balance sheet, but we're known for having made early investments in companies like OpenSea, Axie Infinity, Dapper Labs, Wax, Decentraland, also for acquiring um, uh, the Sandbox, uh, which is now part of the group. Uh, and today, actually, over 400 companies basically are part of the Animoca family. Uh, but we're really operators. We make our own games. Uh, we're working in partnership with companies such as Yuga and Cool Cats and so on, and making Web3 games, also branded games, you know, like with MotoGP and so on, uh, as a global organization. And we also have our own membership NFT uh, collection, which is known as the Mochaverse, which is a way in which we tie everything together. I myself am also on the special council for ApeCoin, uh, where we help basically sort of kick it off in the early days and sort of help establish that. Um, I'm supposed to be living in Hong Kong, although I would say that I've not been there that often. Uh, but, you know, excited about what's happening in the space. And in some ways, I, I think of ourselves a little bit as a bridge between cultures at this point, because much of the early innovation in the sort of digital asset space has come from the West. Uh, but now I think Asia and my, to some extent the Middle East are starting to sort of create a new narrative for themselves as well, given everything that's happening here. So I find myself sort of a little bit of an ambassador for both worlds in, in this case as well. And, you know, I'm, I guess I'm semi-public, part public speaker in some ways, just because of the fact that I find myself talking about and evangelizing the Web3 space a lot, partially because we're so heavily invested in it, but also because we think it's so important to have digital property rights. Right. Yeah. What's interesting is that I feel like you knew that Web3 was coming before a lot of people knew. Like you knew about the Web3 space or at least the metaverse, because I've interviewed you before right. in the past, you know, a few years ago, and we were having, you know, we were talking about the metaverse. Yes. So how did you predict that we would see the rise of the metaverse? 
Well, so, I mean, let's make a distinction quickly. Uh, you know, a lot of people have different interpretations of what the metaverse might be. A lot of people think of the metaverse as VR goggles, immersive virtual reality experiences. To us, these are interfaces. That's not the metaverse. To us, the metaverse, which we describe as the open metaverse, is where we actually have real ownership in this virtual realm and that we look at it like the construction of a nation, basically, where we have a real life, even if it's virtual, where we have an existence, where we own stuff, where we have economic activity. Uh, and in terms of why I thought of, sort of, sort of, let's call it, believed in this early on, I think my journey to the metaverse really began in the 80s. Uh, and that's not because I was thinking about the metaverse as a term, but because my life really started as a kid being virtual. I, I grew up in Austria as a as an Asian minority, and there were very few of us in Vienna back in back in the 80s. And uh, I got online through an early pre-internet service called CompuServe. And you might be too young to remember what that is. And we would connect with something known as an acoustic coupler, which is basically taking one of those rotary phones and you connect them on a device so that you can go online. Uh, so that I'm totally dating myself now at this point. Uh, but I met people online. I wrote software. People paid me for that software when I was just a kid. I made virtual friendships in the 80s. They were just as real to me as my physical friendships. And I guess for me, I never thought of it as a virtual physical distinction. It was just a reality that worked for me. My first job with Atari came from a virtual connection with people I had never met before. And today it's normal, right? And people meet you know, connections, make friendships, have more romantic relationships, entirely spawn from virtual first before it goes into physical. But back in the day, there was abnormal for most people. But now, you know, we're at this point where for me, it was just my life, we could say, right? I set up one of the first ISPs uh, in Asia, in Hong Kong, in, in the early 90s, in that belief. And so for me, the virtual existence was always a reality in some form or fashion. And so when we then saw that we could actually own our stuff really through blockchain technology, it was just like the final piece of the puzzle where we weren't just existing virtually, but that we could actually have sovereignty and exist really in the way that we want to in the virtual world. So that's kind of when we saw NFTs, we saw that with a conviction. We're not crypto OGs in the sense of we got into Bitcoin mining and, you know, in in sort of 2009, 2010 or something. We came fairly late to the game with NFTs because it was very financial in nature. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people, when we first did NFTs, didn't understand it because it was sort of a kind of Wall Street crypto that came first. It was, you know, the trading nature. It was liquidity. Remember in 2018, 2019, we had a true crypto winter. Right. I mean, Bitcoin was like $3,000 or less. Ethereum was hovering at some points below $100, right? I mean, it was pretty, pretty bad times if you reflect in, 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 in sort of in comparison. And here we are saying, oh, you need to have this non-fungible token that trades a lot less than a fungible token, right? And is completely new conceptually. Everyone, particularly in the crypto industry, generally was very critical. Um, and by the way, we're seeing this play out today five years later with Bitcoin. You know, when Bitcoin ordinals launched, interestingly enough, the biggest critics weren't people outside of the Bitcoin community. It was within the Bitcoin community because like, you're, it's not pure, what are you doing? This is not, a, you know, whatever. Um, and I think, you know, we had that same experience, but, you know, with essentially the ETH community back in, back in, back in the sort of, I guess, 27, 20, 2018, which was the early days. Um, so so that, 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 you know, for us, it was just a natural thing. Uh, I'll close with this thought, which is, because we came from gaming and from entertainment, we were very deeply involved in culture. So our belief is that crypto culture is sort of the thing that not just drives mass adoption, but is the thing that drives all economies. Now, we always draw these parallels between the real world and the physical world, uh, the, sorry, the digital world and the, and the physical world. What actually is the reason we spend money and what do we do in real life? We spend predominantly on culture, our clothes, our cultural identities, our assets, our cultural identities, the places we choose to live the districts we want to live in, the, the house or the car that we buy, are symbols of our own culture, of our own identity. And you know, in crypto terms, I would say that culture is the biggest TVL of any economy. And so therefore, in order to make a real economy happen in the metaverse, we must focus on culture first because culture is what drives us. If we only focus on finances, I mean, imagine if America was driven entirely by Wall Street. I think it'd be pretty miserable. And most people wouldn't want that. Um, and you don't derive joy and happiness out of just purely, I mean, some do, but most of us don't derive pure happiness and joy just because of trading, right? Um, but that was kind of the first generation of crypto. But if you want to bring people in and make it a real economy, 
we need to have deep culture and traditions, which is basically what NFTs represent. Okay, so basically NFTs are an important part of the metaverse because they represent culture and traditions. We call the we call NFTs stores of digital culture. Okay, interesting. I like that. So, would you say just given that the metaverse needs NFTs to thrive? Is that an accurate statement? Absolutely. You need containers of culture. I imagine what life would be like if everything we did in the physical world was just utility. First of all, you'd be wearing you'd not be wearing different kind of shoes and fashion. We'd all be wearing the same clothes that make sure that they can't get dirty, right? And we just we'd all be driving the same cars that can take us from point A to point B, right? That would be a world of utility. Sounds like certain kind of countries we probably wouldn't want to live in, um, you know, in terms of some extremely socialist states, for instance, as an example. Um, and that's also because as humans, we have identities, we are diverse. We have, you know, I mean, for anyone who's a parent or who has siblings, you know, you may have been, gro- you may have been raised in exactly the same circumstances, but you're completely different as a personality. You have different feelings, emotions about things. You're just, we're, you know, and in fact, I think what makes sort of humanity and human innovation and ingenuity shine is the fact that we are, in fact, sort of these diverse mutations. We're not the same. We're not ants, right? Mm -hmm. We have very sort of different ideas about who we want to be. And that drives much of the creation that we have seen in human history. So I think to us, this aspect of personal dedicated culture is critical. And it needs, we need that for innovation to flourish. Mm -hmm. So let's take a step back. And you recently gave a TED Talk on the metaverse. And you told me before we started the interview that you were the only TED Talk to talk about Web3. Yes, that's correct. Um, As far as I know, and I think we were the only ones specifically talking, even uttering the word Web3, (laughs) basically, um, and and broadly what we call the open metaverse uh, at at TED. It was an astounding experience. I think TED is a -a one-of-a-kind conference. But I think one of the reasons why I felt more pressure in that talk was not only because I was perhaps one of the lone representatives. Uh, and you know, after the talk, we had a very tiny sort of uh, cohort of Web3 fans come together and sort of you know, talk about it. It was less than you know, I can count on my, my basically two hands. That's how small that community was there. But the feedback I got from people not from the space was they never knew about Web3 and the metaverse in that way because they were equally confused about it because of, frankly, meta or you know, what used to be Facebook's interpretation of the metaverse, right? It's like they think of it as VR goggles or they think of it as virtual reality experiences, which, you know, is, is again, as I said, interfaces. Uh, and so they were confused as to what was the value. Why would you do it? So I think digital property rights was something that I think really resonated and they understood the importance of this. This is even more relevant because, you know, obviously most of the talks at TED were all around AI, unsurprisingly. But most of the concerns around AI was, well, if AI can create all these things, then what matters? What's actually of value to us? And how can I know that, you know, who made this original content? And this is actually why digital property rights is important, because if you know through something like an on-chain mechanic that it is your asset, then if someone used it, you are entitled to these rights, right? Um, The other thing, of course, is authenticity and provenance becomes much more important than the mere act of producing, for instance. Uh, And again, the only way to protect that is to have a form of digital property. And property, in this case, isn't just owning something of value that's physically. It's actually having an identity, something that belongs to you and that is exclusively yours and that you can sort of attach something to that uh, nobody can take away from you because it is yours. So when I think, so based on what you're saying, digital property in the metaverse, that being a use case, what does that look like? I mean, are we talking about a virtual environment with digital homes that are tied to physical properties in real life? It could be, but it doesn't have to be. I think the very first use cases we're seeing today already stems from uh, sort of virtually digitally native kinds of property. Now, let's just step back a little bit about how does property work in the physical world. We all assume, well, we don't all assume, but many assume that I own this house because I physically live in this place. You don't own this house because you physically live in this place. You own this house because you have a title deed that is maintained by a government, which you have presumably elected into, that gives you the protection to do so. If you happen to live in an unstable government that can get overthrown, as happens in some countries, whatever deed you have is completely worthless. You know, it's a, it's a bunch of bricks that you could be living in, but the reality is that someone can simply take it away because in a centralized environment or one that's sort of, you know, overthrown, whatever rights you had before, you no longer have, which is what happens when there's a war, a revolution, all that kind of stuff, right? So really, the value isn't specifically in the physicality of it. The value is in 
the sort of rights granted to you by whatever that authority is, which is in the form of a government. And then, of course, there's network effects attached to that. The virtual world is the same in the sense that, you know, now that I own, for instance, a land in Sandbox, I can now have the provenance of this because the blockchain verifies it. So it does that. It creates a, the certainty that I own this land. Whether the land has network effects because other people live in it or because other people desire it is another effect. But you can only build network effects if you can actually at least prove the ownership. If I can't prove the ownership of my physical land, you can never get a mortgage from a bank. You can't get collateral for it. Nobody will do business with you. I can't rent it to someone because I don't can't prove that ownership. Likewise, a country where you can only rent, there's no capital formation that's possible. So the same is true for the metaverse. And the only difference is that our digital existence was entirely rental in nature. Everything you buy, for instance, in the video game is rented. I don't own it. That's a hundred billion dollars we spent last year on purely rental goods. But actually, we should own it. And once we do own it, then we have an ability to create these capital formation and do other things to it because we have that ownership. And trading and selling them is one use case, which became the predominant narrative in the early days. But that's actually not the only use case. You can compose experiences on top of it. You can have interoperability. You can, you can you know, gift it. You can do all sorts of things with it as a result of that. So we think that's the first use case. Let's just sort of think about the other perspective, which is we spend... Uh, in Asia, for instance, we spend over nine hours a day online. That's most of our waking hours, which basically means we're already digitally dependent. Also think about what you think is important in your day. Is it important, you know, what you do physically or is it important how many likes you might have on Instagram or on TikTok or on Facebook? Does it matter how many views you get on YouTube or does it matter, you know, who sees you in this restaurant or locale, right? Our virtual life is already sort of maybe for many of us more important than a physical one with one difference. The value we accrue to these virtual networks don't belong to us. We use Instagram. We give most of the value to Instagram. They own the customer. You actually don't know who that person is. And they can remove it, by the way, right? The famous story of when Facebook renamed itself to Meta, the, I think it was an Australian lady, lady who owned the Metaverse handle on Instagram. And they removed it from her because she was impersonating you know, Facebook at that time. You know, of course, after much outcry, she got it back. But it's a perfect example of how we don't own anything in the digital realm pre-NFTs. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Asia, and you also mentioned the Middle East when you when you know we started the interview, and then you said the West is kind of you know what did you mean by that? Are we do you think that we'll see adoption in terms of metaverse advancement in Asia, the Middle East versus like here in the United States, and why? So first, uh, you know the the U.S. in particular has always been a leader in innovation for almost everything because it's one of the very maybe the only country in the world that has, an, has a strong tolerance for creative destruction, right? In terms of the kind of innovation that you can have in the U.S. is unique. But the U.S. also has an interesting problematic circumstance right now combined with, you know, the uncertain regulatory framework uh, together with some of the big sort of scandals that happened last year, um, which basically has given it quite a bit of negative sentiment. And also, I think broadly in the West, there's been a much more negative narrative around capitalism broadly. So not specifically crypto, although that has been affecting it. And we can see this in American politics and things like, you know, the rise of sort of socialist ideas being actually sort of acceptable, you know, political platforms. And, you know, the fight of sort of arguably about sort of what is America being sort of, I guess, the center of capitalism for a very long time is in question for perhaps the first time in forever. Um, whereas in places like Asia, for instance, and the Middle East, capitalism is something that people appreciate. There is no actual sort of negative sentiment around. In fact, a lot of people have moved away from what used to be very socialist um, or very specifically very communist environments into sort of democratic, um, uh, democratic um, capitalist ones. I mean, you look, for instance, at what happened to China over the last 30, 40 years. Yes, it's a communist country, you could say, but really it's perhaps the most capitalist country in the world in, in, in other ways. South Korea, for instance, which was a country that had nothing over the last, you know, most people don't remember that, or maybe not even know that four decades ago, South Korea's GDP was lower than North Korea and had a lower population. And today, I think it's the 12th, uh, it's the 12th or 13th largest country by GDP um, because it embraced capitalism and because it, it became democratic and had sort of the things and had property rights and all these things that we can see. So in Asia, it's within living memory that despite there being inequality, capitalism broadly has worked for everyone because, you know, my parents or grandparents didn't have anything, right? Whereas uh, in America, I think a lot of people, especially young Americans, haven't seen that work for them. And so generally, you can see this as a railing against capitalism. And crypto, to us, is this feeling of a kind of 
digital capitalism, if you will, right? And, you know, if someone who happened to make money on crypto, it feels somewhat undeserving for someone who's outside of it. Like, did he just get lucky? You know, um, you know, it's unfair. Is this right? You know, all these, all these sentiments and feelings are starting to come into that, which is also one of the reasons why in America, for instance, NFTs in gaming is resisted by a f- you know, reasonably large part of the gaming community, whereas in Asia, it is completely embraced. Yeah. Many of the large Asian game publishers are all saying NFTs, digital property rights in games, even tokenization of games, they look forward to that. In contrast to America, where the big game publishers who had flirted with the idea, in some cases very passionately in 2021, had to completely retreat because of their audiences, not necessarily because they as studio executives uh, didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And also maybe the regulatory landscape here. I mean, I feel like with all the things with FTX and Celsius and everything that's happened, I feel like companies don't want to be associated with NFTs, although there are so many benefits. uh, There are so many benefits. But I think the other thing is when it comes to the regulatory framework, there's a lot of uncertainty. And unfortunately, when you know, I think some other people were commenting on the fact that it feels like regulation by enforcement. And the problem is, is that what are you enforcing? There's clarity. I mean, for instance, Coinbase, you know, basically suing the SEC for asking for clarity is kind of an unprecedented move. Um, pretty bold as well, I would say, and I guess kudos to that. But the thing is that it just shows how desperate, you know, the, I guess the industry is here in America that they have to resort to these methods to get answers. Then you go to Hong Kong, the sort of, just today, the H- HKMA, which is our monetary authority, basically sent a memo to the banks and said, you guys need to relax your, uh, you need to relax the way that you deal with companies dealing with digital assets in order to make the industry thrive. I mean, it's a completely different conversation. Uh, you know, you have, um, you know, crypto ETFs listed on the stock exchange. We have a major Web3 conference. Hong Kong as a government even launched uh, a Web3, uh, sort of a Web3 fund for promoting Web3 activity in Hong Kong, for instance. Then you go to Japan. The prime minister himself has made Web3 and the metaverse part of its national growth agenda. Um, And you see this also in places in the Middle East. And frankly, even parts of Europe, if you look at France, for instance, Mm -hmm. very much progressive in terms of the metaverse and Web3. I think one of the reasons why that's happening is there is a sense of these countries that in Web2, they completely missed out. They were unable to participate and effectively became dependent on American companies, right? All of these countries are in the end using Facebook or using Amazon or using Google, right? So they've basically had their own form of national level type of digital colonization. They are dependent on that. So they see Web3 as a way of actually having some independence. Now you can never count out the US, right? The US is a powerhouse, but while there is remains this regulatory uncertainty, it is driving talent outside of America and I think that's a shame. So hopefully, you know, people here in America at the highest levels will pay attention to what the rest of the world is doing because typically America didn't have to before and maybe sort of take, take note of that and say, in order for us to retain the talent for what is the next iteration of the web, we want this to be in America, we need to stay competitive. And hopefully that'll have an impact in terms of how people think about it in sort of regulation and other activities. Yeah, hopefully. We'll see what happens. I'm curious to see what happens with Coinbase and the SEC. <laughs> I mean, that's fascinating. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's just crazy stuff that's happening now. Mm. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, the metaverse, Do you is there one metaverse or are there multiple metaverses? You know, what What are your thoughts on that? Our interpretation of the metaverse in this case is as being the open metaverse, is that there are going to be multiple of them. And we think of them as nation states. So in other words, there will be a metaverse that could be the equivalent of maybe the US or maybe 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 Switzerland or maybe Hong Kong or Japan. You know, what connects these countries is a national sentiment that is joined by a common culture and common values. We see a version of that online when you think about what how people flock together in communities of groups and things like you know, Reddit and so on. But it's obviously one where you don't have an ownership. You're just sort of coming together with common interest groups. The metaverse actually solidifies that in a much more solid way because now you can have economic activity, create businesses around it. Uh, You know, last year, for instance, you know, there was still $24 billion of sales in NFTs. Not too bad for what's apparently, you know, a bear market, right? Um, And and so it's all relative, right, if you compare it to where where it was before. So there's sufficient economies of scale there that actually resemble those of, you know, small nations. 
And, and that to us basically means that there's an opportunity to build many of these. We think of layer one, layer two blockchains also like economies as well. So you may want to build on Ethereum, you can build on Polygon, you can build on Flow, you can build on Immutable, you can build on all these. They all have their particular flavors. The way that they construct a consensus is also a way in which you might have agreement in them or you have influence in them. That's why you're there. So I think of this as, uh, you know, ideally the more distributed, uh, the healthier it is for the ecosystem. I would worry if there was one, com one master layer, shall we say, or if there was one metaverse. Uh, because first of all, I don't think we function as people this way. We have way too much diverse interests to be able to function like this way. But the other one is, if you have that, you move towards a kind of majority consensus, which is not how we actually really operate. Um, we actually want to protect the rights of our minorities. We want to have that kind of diversity flourish. And that only functions if we have choices. If I don't like this environment, if it's hostile to me, I need to be able to move from one environment to the other. Otherwise, you become deplatformed which is actually what started to happen in Web2. Hmm. Interesting. So I want to get your thoughts on some of the most interesting or just interesting metaverse projects that you think are out there today. I mean, Animoca has invested in so many of these projects. And I get press releases all the time. And one that stands out in my mind is, is it Tiny Tap? Tiny Tap is, you, I yes. keep getting a press release for that one. But I want to know your thoughts on the most interesting projects and why. Well, there's so many, right? It's like a little bit like picking out sort of your favorite child out of uh, out of out of out of many. But let's talk a little bit about Tiny Tap because okay. I actually think Tiny Tap is great. And there's a reason you're getting all these press releases from Tiny Tap. It's because Tiny Tap is doing a lot of things. Uh, and in the same way that Sandbox created this metaverse creator economy where people were building on these platforms, Tiny Tap is doing the same, but it's doing it for teachers. Now, teachers are like this very interesting category of content creators that are not respected as content creators, yet they probably make the most, and perhaps maybe the most valuable content for our society. They teach our children at the end of the day. They, they form the foundation of nations, cultures, and traditions. You know, if you have a bad education system, you have a country with low economic output. You have a country that has low values and low culture. A strong education creates the opposite, right? So it's very, very important. But we underpay those teachers. So what TinyTab does is, it allows teachers who make content on TinyTap to then sell them as you know, just different ways of learning math or English or science or languages. And this platform was a Web2 platform that allowed them to do this in a kind of gig economy kind of way. So think of it as like a Spotify, but for educational content. Most teachers were making $100, $50, $500 a year. Some of them were making thousands of dollars. The very few of them made tens of thousands of dollars a year which is a lot given the fact that the average teacher income, I think, in the U.S. is somewhere between $30,000, maybe $40,000 a year. So it's, 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 not, it's not great. So now when you make content that is only worth $1,000 a year, you know, it's, it's a nice side income. But if you can sell it as something that has capital formation because it's now an asset, because it has yield, you could sell it for 10% for yield for $10,000. You give a teacher $10,000 for the sale of the asset, that changes their life. You sell them $1,000 a year, that's an add-on to, to that. And with NFTs, you can now sell an asset that is content you've created, kind of like an app, for instance. But through the single transaction, you can get the contractual rights, the commercial rights, the IP rights, and also whatever legal documentation embedded in a single transaction that in the traditional world required you to sign a contract, hire a lawyer, right? The cost of you know, buying a $100 or $1,000 asset would be prohibitive. That's why people don't do it. But with an NFT, you can, for the cost of literally dollars, can start actually transacting assets that are worth maybe tens of dollars, or hundreds of dollars, or thousands of dollars. Now, this has really big implications because it means you create capital formation on the smallest assets. When we sold our first teacher NFTs, we generated something like 230,000 US dollars for, I think it was like six teachers. It was essentially game-changing money for them. Um, and, uh, and you know, they started hiring their friends and whatever to build those type of businesses. Uh, but also, it demonstrated what happens when you get this capital formation. And the interesting thing is that the buyers of them weren't what we thought might be publishers or individuals. Some of them were DeFi protocols because of the fact that it's real yield. Because it was, you know, actual cash income. People were paying for education and they were able to sort of, you know, utilize that. So that's exciting to me uh, because there's so many teachers in the world. There's more teachers than artists, for instance, in the world. Um, and they frankly drive a lot more direct impact. And if we enable them to have value in the world of Web3, then they can also become a very powerful sort of force in terms of adoption, because after all, they are educating our next generation. 
So that's why we're kind of excited about that. But you know, we're excited about all of our games that are coming out, like Life Beyond, for instance, or what's happening with Phantom Galaxies. Because again, gaming is probably going to drive more volume of mass adoption just because of the fact that there's already 3.4 billion people who play games. So they already are more metaversal in their experiences. Yeah, I mean, I love that. That basically answers my next question, which I always like to end the podcast on, you know, how can we drive mass adoption? Well, you kind of just answered that. And I think having that category of teachers is mm. amazing. I didn't know that about Tiny Tap, and I just think that's really revolutionary. Um, but gaming, for sure, like you said, that, that may be the thing that will drive mass adoption to Web3 and NFTs and the metaverse. Yes, it's also because of the fact that you know, gaming adoption on Web3, despite the fact that it's generated so much value, uh, relatively speaking to its customer base, is still very, very small. You know, there's a chart that demonstrated the number of people that are in Web3 compared to how people had internet adoption back in 2001. And it sort of sort of charts eerily one-to-one. -one. But I think the gap in the original days of, uh, of, of the internet was physical connections, like buying a broadband connection, getting online, that was sort of the barrier, you know, having to sort of lay the cable literally across the oceans. Those were physical barriers. In the Web3 adoption, frankly, opening up uh, MetaMask or Griffin Wallet or anything like that isn't actually what's complicated. It's actually quite easy. It's more of a mental state. It's an understanding. Because the other thing that happens when you actually fully transition into Web3 is you actually upgrade yourself for in terms of financial literacy, literally like several notches up, right? The, the correlation between people in Web3 who have a level of financial literacy is very high. Whereas in Web2, you know, the financial literacy ratio is single digit percentages, right? So that means that when we onboard people into Web3, we're not just onboarding them in terms of, you know, here is an application and you can use it. You have to onboard them in an educational way to let them know about what is value. What does it mean to have an asset? What does it mean to have ownership? There's, there's a lesson that comes in it. So that's more of a, I guess, um, an educational onboarding than it is a technical onboarding, if you will. Right, yeah. Well, I'm happy that I know about Web3 and I just want the, the world to know about it. Be Absolutely. It can be life-changing. It is life-changing. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yet, we're gonna wrap things up. So any final thoughts for the listeners that you wanna share before we say goodbye? I wanna share one stat last year. Um, I did share this as a TED Talk and I think that was sort of one of the more convincing arguments. Why, why does Web3 matter? Last year, we had $24 billion of sales in NFTs. 90% of that value went to creators and owners of these NFTs. In that same year, Spotify paid out $7 billion to creators. What we're seeing already, and this is, you know, Spotify serves millions of creators and hundreds of millions of users in contrast to the Web3 NFT space, which is still, you know, much smaller in number. Imagine what happens when you onboard the Spotify community fully into Web3, what happens to their value and how that's distributed. And that's why Web3 matters. And if you want to understand Web3 and the open metaverse, there really is no going back. And that's why I think it's a foregone conclusion from our perspective that Web3 will ultimately, you know, the web of ownership will ultimately be the sort of future iteration of the web as we transition from Web2 to Web3. Yeah. Well, that's great. And that's why there's the, the podcast Web3 Deep Dive. We've got to teach the world about it. And I'm just so happy you came on the show because everything you say is so informative. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yat. Thank you. Thanks.